Welcome to the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast, where you will learn how to identify, evaluate, negotiate, perform due diligence on, finance, turn around, and operate mobile home parks. And now, here is your host, the fifth largest mobile home park owner in the United States, Frank Rolf. How many of you have been chased down the street by a 300 pound man wearing only a diaper? I have. This is Frank Roth of Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast Series. We're talking about tough turnarounds in this third part of our five-part series. We're going to talk about a park that I own called Hidden Hollow. Now, let me tell you the background on this property. It's such a strange, strange deal. A broker came to me and said, I've got a property, but it's a really, really big mess. And because of that, the seller wants a very small amount for it and will even carry the paper. Check out the price on this, $60,000 with $5,000 down. It came with 15 mobile home lots and a brick home built back in the 1940s. It had petrified wood stuck into the bricks as a decorative feature. I mean, that's a really old home. And the deal was that mom and pop would sell this so cheaply because the park had no rent roll, no P&Ls, They didn't know the name of any of the residents. No one had ever paid rent. Now, you might say, how is that possible? Well, it was an inheritance. This person inherited this mobile home park from a family member. And when they received it, they were so afraid of it, they didn't know what to do with it. So they didn't want to charge anyone any rent because if they had to charge them rent, they thought there might be some kind of friction with people who wouldn't pay. And besides, you'd have to get people's names. These were kind of affluent people. They wanted nothing to do with the trailer park. So they just wanted to sell it as is. And all they could tell you about it is how many lots it had, the fact that it came with the house, and that's it. No other information was provided because they frankly didn't have any. Now, when you hear a deal that's that cheap, of course, you're going to take on the project. And that's exactly what I did. Sight unseen, I said, yes, I will take it. I'll have the $5,000 ready for you immediately. Let's go see what's going on here. I knew some things on the front end. I knew enough about Dallas-Fort Worth to know that Lake Worth, which is where the park is, is an area that's not bad. It's okay. It's not a bad area. So I already knew the market was decent. But the park itself, wow, what a wreck. The first thing I had to do is I had to reestablish the rent roll. I had to know who lived in the park. I couldn't even send invoices till I knew which homes were occupied and which were vacant. So to do that, I had to go door to door. So I would go and knock on a door and say, hi, I'm Frank from the management company. Interesting point. Never say you're owning a mobile home park. It's a very, very bad idea. If you're just from the management company, people are not nearly going to be as mad or treat you poorly as if you're just with the management company. So I was Frank from the management company. We're trying to get a handle on the park. Could you give me your name? Well, I went to each successive home, and the first few people were fairly friendly, but they all said, don't knock on number seven. And I thought, why is that? And they would say, don't, just don't do it. It's a bad idea. You, you will not be happy if you knock on the door on number seven. So I did number one, number two, number three, number four, five, six, and I came down to seven. I knocked on the door, and without any question or anything, the door flies open and a giant bearded man, he must have weighed at least 300 pounds, wearing only white underwear, which looked just like a diaper with his stomach hanging over it. He just starts running at me, kind of just growling. And I thought, oh my God, this is no, no time for, uh, for quiet discussion. So I ran off the, the steps of the mobile home and started running down the street like a big old baby with him in pursuit. Now, the only good news is he was giant, couldn't run very far. He totally winded himself. I ran out of the park and thought, wow, okay, now I see why you don't knock on the door of number seven. Obviously, the guy must have been either mentally ill or has a very, very poor temper or certainly doesn't like strangers. So in any event, I ultimately went back, finished the mission, got all the names, knew what was vacant, knew what had residents in it, knew who I could then bill. And then I had to come up with an idea of how to stabilize this big old mess. So all I have now is the information of who lives in each unit, which ones are vacant and occupied. But that doesn't really get me anywhere. I've got to figure out how to actually make this a stabilized income-producing property. So what do I do? Well, first thing to do is i got to get the invoices out for the next upcoming month. So I send the invoices out based on what the residents told me they thought the lot rent was. That's all I had to go by since there were no leases of any type. 
So I would assume everyone was in this park on a month-to-month basis. Sent out all of the invoices for that monthly amount, and right away, many people paid me. Others did not pay me. So those who did not pay me, I sent them demand letters. Those who did not pay after the demand letter, I filed an eviction on. I pretty much filed eviction on about a third of everybody in the park. They had all been living there for free, and frankly, they'd had no money anyway. Bearded man, the diaper, was among them. He never paid, no effort to pay, no response to the letter, filed eviction. The great thing about evictions, of course, it's then up to the process server to face the uh, wrath of the giant bearded man. So I never had to see that guy again. And most of them did not even make any efforts to pay or to even communicate. And they just basically ran off. So they just threw their stuff in their pickup truck and they drove off, leaving me with a, a few occupied units, a bunch of empty units, some empty lots and an empty house. So then what do you do? Well, the people who were living in there, the few residents I had that were were occupying those dwellings, they had no pride of ownership at all. So if I was going to try and build the park back, I knew I had to first off make the park look presentable. So I went to them and explained to them that we were trying to make the property the nicest it could be. And that meant a few minimum items that they had to have skirting on their homes. They had to paint their homes. They had to have no non-running cars, no debris in the yards, just basic items like that. And to be honest with you, most of the, these folks were pretty friendly. That's why they had paid is because they actually wanted to live there. They wanted a nice place to live. And they kind of had been held hostage by all those crazy people, the giant mountain man in the diaper. So they were relieved to finally have a nice, safe, quiet, clean place again. So they did a pretty good job of cleaning up. And the ones who could not afford to make repairs, I made the repairs for them. So the homes that were occupied suddenly went from looking awful to looking fairly decent. That left me with the homes that were abandoned. I went through all the abandoned homes to figure out which ones could be saved and which ones needed to be scrapped. And to my amazement, none of them needed to be scrapped. They fell in two categories, either not bad, that needed just a little bit of work to be ready, and those that needed more significant work, but nothing that was of a level that would make you want to scrap the home. There was not a lot of water intrusion, not a lot of roof issues, didn't see any evidence of any mold. So basically, I hired some guys to come in and start rehabbing the homes. We started with the exteriors on all of them, so that when we had the first one ready to rent or sell, the drive-up would be decent. And at the same time, I also did some work on the abandoned stick-built home, which in fact had been Mom and Pop's house when the park was built. So I basically just worked on trying to stabilize what I had. I had a few residents paying rent. I had a bunch of vacant stuff that was all my property now. And I want to take my property and make it nice and decent again. So that's what we did. We, we cleaned it. We painted it. We put skirting on. We fixed it all up. Now, the next step of the puzzle, of course, once you stabilize is you want to maximize your income. So what I did was I ran ads in the newspaper. This predates Craigslist, so there was no Craigslist. I put signs in the yard saying it's home for sale, homes for rent in the windows. And lo and behold, I started getting calls from people who wanted to live in a detached dwelling in Lake Worth, and they would go out, and I myself would show them the homes. I would drive over there and meet them and show them the homes, and most of them liked what they saw. We signed up leases, did background screening, and put them in there. So pretty soon, I had all the vacant homes occupied. At that point, I needed to go ahead and get somebody to serve as my eyes and ears in the field. There really wasn't much to do for anyone when I had only three or four occupied, but now that I was getting closer to eight or nine, I found somebody in the park who seemingly was nice and pleasant and liked living there and someone I felt I could work with and made them the manager. And now I was really ready to go to town and trying to maximize the income of the property. So what I did was, next step was I got to fill those vacant lots. I had these lots sitting there doing no no one any good where they could really be nice income units. The rent was fairly high. It was in the $300 range. So I went to all the local dealers and said, I've got vacant lots. Could you bring any homes in? And I suddenly realized I had a niche that might work. The dealers in Lake Worth, many of them had trade-ins that they had in the back of their lots that were not in very good condition, but they were decent. And they were never going to be purchased inside the back of a mobile home park lot. So I proposed that they bring those homes over to the park, put those on the vacant lots, and then skirt them, connect the utilities, and they could sell them on location as a turnkey done deal. I convinced two different dealers to try it. And in both cases, it worked. So then I got some repeat business. I even had one dealer bring in a new home. He did so well on the old homes, he actually stuck a new home in and it sold also. So next thing you knew, we had the park basically full. 
Then came the house itself. What do you do with the house? Well, obviously sitting there, it's of no value. But if I could just get it rented, that rent would count the same as lot rent towards the eventual loan or sale of the park because it is, after all, real property. Remember that the lots are real property. A stick built's real property. Mobile homes are personal property, so letters don't give them the same credit. But if I could just get that stick built rented, I would really have something going on. So what do you do? I called in people who do home renovations. We found the foundation was shot, the roof was shot, the wiring was shot. But I ran the numbers. I could do the foundation and the roof and the wiring for about ten to fifteen thousand dollars. And if I could get all that done, the home would rent for about six to seven hundred dollars a month. If you do the numbers on that, seven hundred dollars of rent, less the expense ratio, which was about thirty percent, meant that that home would be worth sixty thousand dollars roughly at the applicable cap rate. So it was well worth investing 15000 in the home to get back $60,000 of value. So that's exactly what I did. Meanwhile, I put up a new sign to make the park look nice. I did some landscaping to it, cut down dead trees, dead tree limbs, all the items you typically would do with the property. And soon I had myself a nice little property that was making a nice income. Now, what are the lessons learned from this? How did I go from a park where I knew no one's name no leases, nothing to a park that was actually functioning well and sightly and something you could have pride in. Well, the first off, the item is always think of that that concept of stabilize and maximize. That's kind of the chant of the turnaround expert. You got to take what's there before you even start to think about, hey, I could do this or I could do that. Stabilize what you have. Get rid of any of the dead wood. In this case, I had people in there who were not paying, not following the rules, They had to go. So first you stabilize, then you maximize. Number two, you have to pick turnaround situations where you know that you can fix the problem. What was the big problem in this park? Well, it was the owner. They had let it go completely to seed. They didn't know anyone's names. They weren't doing any billing. So obviously you do not attract good customers when you can live there for free. I knew I could beat those problems. I had one important tool working for me. I knew the location was good. I was in a residential area in a town that was fairly nice. So I knew that if I could just go in there and get this part cleaned up, I would win because I knew the location was not bad at all. Also, what was very important in this deal was buying it really cheap with a lot of seller carry. There's a maximum out there that any park is desirable to buy if it's zero down with the seller carrying all the paper non-recourse. While that may be true to some degree, there are certain cases where you still wouldn't want to buy it. For example, if it has some kind of environmental hazard issue. That is what got me into the deal to begin with. I would have been smart enough to know, and you should also be smart enough to know, you could not get a conventional bank loan on a property where there's no rent roll or any P&Ls. Banks like to see the last three years' performance. They would never, ever underwrite a deal where there was no financial performance of any type. So that just would not work for about anybody. Another lesson learned from this deal is Even deals that are really, really, really messed up like that can ultimately be fixed. You have to come up with the methodology to fix it. I knew that even despite the fact that no one was paying and we didn't know who anyone was or what they paid, that these are fixable items. There's a methodology to do it. You give people new leases. You non-renew people. You send demand letters. All the items from no play, no stay and no pay, no stay, those two features can all be done even on a mobile home park that's been virtually abandoned in the field. So there's nothing holding you back from making things happen if you'll only give it a try. So that's the story of Hidden Hollow. Now, you can't go out and look at it today because it's been redeveloped. The location was good enough that, in fact, it ultimately became commercial property and was ultimately purchased and demolished. So there's no really evidence of Hidden Hollow that remains today. But I thought it would be an interesting, tough turnaround to go over because I've really never, ever since ever had one where there were no records of any type. And I've certainly never been chased down the street by a giant man in a diaper before or since. Now, on our next in this five-part series, we're going to go over a park that looks just like Berlin after the war, maybe even rougher over in Illinois. So this is Frank Roth, the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast Series. I'll be back again soon with another tough turnaround. Thank you for listening to the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast. Be sure to visit us at mhpmastery.com to subscribe to the show. Read our show transcriptions and access all of our great information on mobile home park investing.